Thank you for that introduction. And I'm sorry I couldn't be there uh, with you today. Uh, by the time Canada lifted its return travel restrictions, I'd already been assigned to work this weekend. And it's, a, it's the Canadian long weekend. And I'm sure it's the same there that uh, long weekends are quite hard to, uh, to trade. So apologies, uh, virtually just gonna have to do in, in this case, I guess. Um, before I get started, I have no industry um, COIs, um, but I do have my sources of research funding and uh, in-kind support uh, listed on the screen there. Now you've seen my objectives on that rolling slide, um, and I'd like to start with highlighting the changing CICU patient acuity and complexity before diving into staffing models and training. Um, and you know, this is, it's been 55 years since the introduction of the coronary care unit uh, by Killip and Kimball. And um, 15 years after the introduction of the, uh, the coronary care unit, this is an article from uh, Dr. Killip kind of reflecting on the initial experience. And I'll give you a moment to read it, but my take on this quote is that it was initially um, uh, conceived as an arrhythmia monitoring and uh, response unit, nothing more and, uh, and nothing less. It was just timely uh, defibrillation. Um, but over time, people far smarter than me, nearly 20 years ago, started recognizing that the patient population was, uh, was drastically changing. But how do we quantify this? Uh, do we have numbers to put this into perspective? And the first analysis was done at a Duke University by my friend Jason Katz, and it looked at 10-year trends between 96 ending in 2006, which is relevant here, and ending in 2006, um, patients at the single tertiary center, well, 40% had acute renal failure, 40% um, were on vasopressors, about a third had invasive mechanical ventilation, and 10% had multisystem organ failure, what we'd call the historical domain of medical and surgical ICUs. Procedures had changed over that 10 years too. There was decline in swan GANs, but a rise in central venous catheterization and prolonged mechanical ventilation, also the historical domain of, of um, uh, medical ICUs. Um, Jason, uh, Jake Jenser from Mayo kind of picked this up and noticed the dates. This is another single center analysis picking up in 2007, ending in 2018. And what they found ending in 2018, that about one in four people had shock, one in five had cardiogenic shock, 13% uh, had cardiac arrest, and respiratory failure was, uh, was present in more than uh, a third. Um, interestingly, the, uh, the trends are aligned, but multi-system organ failure started at 12% and then rose to over a third um, by the end of 2018, and acute kidney injury. Um, was present in about 40%. Similarly, uh, the Mayo Clinic described a rise in critical field procedures, such as um, uh, arterial line and central line um, catheterization in almost 40%. And on the right here, you can see that about one in four required uh, intravenous vasoactives. And if you add up non-invasive and invasive mechanical ventilation, they were between 35 and 40% of the population. On top of the acuity, um, this is an, an analysis by uh, Sinan colleagues um, looking at, I think about 300, or sorry, just over 3 million uh, Medicare beneficiaries. And the thing I wanted to point out is that between 2003 and 2013, the comorbidity profile had risen, um, looking, uh, looking at the number of major comorbidities uh, in excess of, um, uh, of three. They rose from about a third to over 50%, thus suggesting that not only is the acuity uh, increasing, but the complexity of the background medical uh, conditions is, is rising. Well, is this a US phenomenon or does this extend to other countries? And I can say from my own work that we're also seeing this in, in Canada. And this is a chi high analysis. This is Canadian Institute of Health Information. And this included um, about 460,000 um, different CICU admissions over an 11 year period. Uh, two thirds were to academic and PCI capable centers. And what we found is about 87% had a primary cardiac condition. Right across the middle of the screen, you can see that there's a, a significant drop over time in stable coronary artery disease. But, that, but this was sort of compensated by a rise in non-ST elevation MI and, uh, and STEMI. Uh, cardiogenic shock and heart failure. 
Similarly, there was a, a slow but steady rise in uh, procedures, catheterization, mechanical ventilation, dialysis, cardiac arrest. But um, these overall numbers are sort of belied by the intra-hospital variation. And what you can see here is that some of our CICUs in Canada are very, very sick. And at least one hospital had 100% of patients who require at least one uh, critical care restricted therapy or monitoring. Uh, ventilation was as high as 31%, dialysis at 14%, and up to a third required cardiac or had cardiac arrest or required active resuscitation while in uh, the units. Fortunately, despite this rising acuity and cakes mix in, in Canada, regardless of whether they were admitted with a cardiac or non-cardiac condition, it's somewhat reassuring to know that our mortality rates have been dropping overall. Now, many of you might sort of say that, well, this is, uh, this is a sort of national level data, and it includes a lot of community CICUs, which really don't represent what you guys do as a, as a major referral center. What is the spectrum of care in tertiary centers? And we've sort of answered that through the Cardiac Critical Care Trials Network. Initially started um, as a collection of um, centers, uh, primarily academic and tertiary in US and Canada. And it's since grown to, it's pushing 40 centers that are regularly uh, contributing annual snapshots. And what this shows here on the right is that the primary admitting condition is still MI. But that varies widely between centers, as low as 15% to as high as 57%. Cardiogenic shock is the number two condition um, with atrial arrhythmia is number three. You'll see here that uh, the second largest bar is a smattering of conditions from everything from valvular heart disease to complex congenital. Well, what is the reason for admission? And somewhat surprisingly across the top is that the reason they need the ICU admission is actually not for a cardiac cause, at least directly. Um, you can see here that uh, in over 25%, it's respiratory failure or insufficiency as the primary driver for admission, followed by unstable arrhythmias and cardiogenic shock. Down at the bottom, you see um, a large proportion of patients are admitted for post-procedural monitoring or frequent labs and tests. And I'm going to come back to this a little bit later, um, trying to highlight perhaps the overutilization of high acuity care. Well, what is the, or what are the proportion of patients that require critical care restricted therapies as, um, you know, as a rough proxy for appropriateness of admission? And you can see in the, uh, you can see in the middle here that uh, ne uh, nearly 40% need intravenous vasoactives, about 30% um, need invasive hemodynamic monitoring. When you add up all um, respiratory um, therapies, uh, invasive, non-invasive, or high-flow um, oxygen therapy, it, it approximates about one in, third, one in three patients uh, require something of a respiratory nature. A whopping 40% require nothing at all, and that varies widely between institutions. You can see here that the proportion of patients that require no critical care, uh, advanced critical ther therapies between sites uh, in tertiary centers range from 14 to uh, 62%. We're not perfect at the University of Alberta. We're somewhere here uh, in the middle. I can't remember if we're G or H, but uh, definitely some, um, some room to improve. Now, you're gonna ask me, I'm showing all this variation data and I haven't dug into it yet. Well, the reason I'm showing this data is twofold. One is it allows people uh, um, listening can, to benchmark uh, if they have their data, what their own institution uh, institutional practices are. And number two, I'm, or I'm gonna set the stage for my fourth objective to try and sort of highlight what this institutional variation means and what opportunities we have to improve, uh, um, uh, improve admission practices. So I promise I'm gonna come back to this variation uh, issue a little bit later. What about cardiogenic shock? What does it look like in the, uh, the CIC? Well, two thirds of patients still are, that are admitted with shock still are primary cardiogenic. But what is more surprisingly is that uh, one in five uh, patients with shock are actually mixed shock and 10% are actually hypovolemic or distributive shock, which sort of highlights the need for uh, advanced competencies in non-cardiogenic shock conditions. The other surprising thing here is that it's not acute MIs that are forming the most of the cardiogenic shocks in our units. It's ischemic and non-ischemic heart failure um, that are uh, um, forming about 50% uh, of all cases. 
And not surprisingly, you can see here that those with mixed shock conditions have a higher, have higher points to estimates for in-hospital mortality. Well, is there variation in the way we practice with cardiogenic shock? And the short answer is yes. Um, the proportion of patients receiving um, advanced mechanical or temporary mechanical circulatory support ranges from 17 to 50%, probably highlighting the lack of a good RCT evidence. Um, you can also see here that in red, the proportion of all shock patients receiving um, mechanical circulatory support um, in, here is advanced circulatory support, meaning non-IABP. And this varies significantly between um, centers, highlighting the need for, for research. Well, you'd probably say, well, all these centers are a little bit different. Maybe the Mayo Clinic or Brigham or whatever this center, they just have sicker patients and maybe they need more advanced circulatory support. Um, but that's actually not the case. This is a somewhat complex graph that I wanna walk you through. We divided all the centers into low, medium, and high MCS utilization, and then further subdivide them by IABP shock two scores, low, medium, and high. And when you look across the centers, the proportion of low and high risk shock is relatively stable between the low and the high utilization centers, thus suggesting that the utilization of more advanced mechanical circulatory support is not driven by um, patient level differences, rather by institutional practice patterns. What about respiratory failure and mechanical ventilation? Well, you can see here that amongst all CIC admissions in the C3TN, about, uh, about uh, one in three receive some form of advanced respiratory ther uh, therapy. Um, and that uh, the, the biggest utilizers are cardiogenic shock, general medical problems, and acute heart failure. But this varies significantly between hospitals between uh, 15 and 56%. And I don't mind saying that in our own hospital, we kind of vary with just mechanical ventilation. Um, if we're between 17 and 21%. I don't have the data for high flow or non-invasive uh, available, but we're, we're somewhere in the, the middle of, uh, of this group. And it's not surprising to see here that if you have respiratory failure um, and an additional cardiac complications that the, uh, the rate of death is very, very high. When, one, when a second organ fails after the heart, um, it's an independent risk factor for mortality, and that's probably not a surprise to anyone. What about advanced renal replacement therapy or acute renal replacement therapy in the CICU? Well, on the left here, you can see that the biggest or the most common conditions requiring um, renal replacement therapy are MI, cardiogenic shock, and heart failure. Um, it's used somewhat infrequently, 6% of the overall CICU population in tertiary centers, but a huge inter-hospital um, inter range as low as 1% to as high as 16%. And it's probably not surprising that if your kidneys are failing, you have a lot of other CICU restricted therapies, including intravenous drips, mechanical ventilation, or mechanical circulatory support. Um, uh, and when the kidneys fail on top of the heart, you have Overall, the median um, uh, in-hospital mortality rate is about 42%. Again, probably not surprising when you have um, more than one organ failing in hospital, but this really high mortality rate um, really uh, suggests the need for risk prediction scores to help identify futility versus um, potential uh, um, uh, benefit of CRRT in this high-risk population. So to end my first section, I'm posing the question, have we evolved into a medical ICU? And my short answer is no, but there's, there is a growing overlap in diagnoses, you know, such as ischemic heart disease, diabetes, uh, obesity, hypertension, CKD. Uh, there is, um, you know, um, oh, sorry, that was comorbidities. The diagnoses, including respiratory failure and ischemic heart disease are overlapping. Um, when you have critical care restricted therapies, there's going to be overlap in complications such as ventilator acquired pneumonia or central line infections. And we do have overlap in critical care therapies, um, you know, such as mechanical ventilation, dialysis, and vasoactive meds. But the CICU is still different. We don't see a whole lot, at least in Canada, of Swan GANS catheters, transvenous pacing, or mechanical circulatory support in our medical ICUs. And this has implications for staffing and training, which I'm going to highlight a little bit later. So for my second objective, 
what is the evidence to support new staffing models? And um, I want to go back uh, 20 years to the Pronovost um, meta-analysis and ICUs that compared to open versus closed uh, staffing units. And they defined here closed units uh, or high intensity units as either closed units staffed only by intensivists or mandatory intensive care um, consultation. And what you can see here is that there was a 40% um, a decrease odds in in-hospital mortality in a closed unit. And these are medical and surgical ICUs and a few pediatric units. But what is the evidence in CICUs? And the evidence is emerging, but it is there. And this is a before and after study from the University of North Carolina when they went from an open model with multiple unit attendings to a single unit attending in a closed model. And Point estimates for mortality decreased, albeit non-significantly, uh, but what they did find is that there was a, uh, a one-day decrease in um, uh, median length of stay. What they also found here is despite an increase in the case net mix, mix index, as shown by this line here as a proxy for complexity, that overall costs in the, um, in the CISU on a per patient basis went down in the closed model. Um, what about mortality? And this is Elliot Miller's analysis from Yale. And they, they closed their CICU in 2017. And you can see here prior to 2017, it was a potpourri of attendings, uh, university and private group based, uh, attending in a 14 bed unit. And they transitioned to a closed unit um, with a heart failure team or an, or an IC team. And what you can see here is that after they closed the unit, after multivariable adjustment, there was a significant de decrease in in-hospital mortality and CICU mortality. And looking at specific conditions, this was largely driven by people admitted with cardiac arrest or respiratory failure, albeit point estimates for even things like acute compensated heart failure did improve, uh, albeit uh, the confidence intervals didn't cross, I still crossed one. Um, what is surprising, despite this data, um, this is a survey from 2017 of Action Get With The Guidelines and Mission Lifeline Hospitals with about 517 responses, is that at least five years ago, that three out of four CICUs in the U.S. remained open. And um, academic or tertiary units, units were a little bit better, um, albeit not perfect, that 60% of the units were still open. So here's a huge opportunity for improvement across the United States in, in terms of improving the staffing model and potentially improving uh, patient care outcomes. In the US, compared to the US, this is surprising to us that in Canada, we're not perfect, but at least in a, uh, a survey uh, six years ago, we found that three out of our four units in academic centers were closed. Well, we, we can talk about the staffing models, but what about the levels of care? And one of the principles we've put forward is getting the highest acuity patients to the centers that can comprehensively centralize their care from resuscitation through to recovery or destination therapy. And the rationale behind these systems of care is that clinical volumes are tied to patient outcomes. Um, this, is, this is a meta-analysis of uh, 10 PCI studies, 1.3 million patients, it's not going to surprise any of you that high volume PCI improves outcomes. Um, same in surgery. This is seven papers, 1.4 million um, uh, patients undergoing cabbage. High volume um, cabbage centers have better outcomes. Well, this extends to non-procedural uh, care too. Um, and if we look from uh, this um, Medicare analysis of 3.4 million people, uh, we can certainly find thresholds for MI at about 610, um, thresholds for heart failure at 500, and pneumonia at about 210, thus suggesting that it's not just the procedure, it's the volume of medical care that is associated with outcomes as well. And in the CICU, uh, I'm sure many of you are aware of the outcomes that cardiogenic shock volumes are associated with outcomes. But more recent data led by one of my fellows show that um, in mechanical ventilation volumes in the CICU matter as well. And this is another pan-Canadian analysis of nearly 50,000 patients undergoing mechanical ventilation, nine out of 10 of whom were invasive and the other 10% were non-invasive mechanical ventilation. And what you can see here with the, the averaging line is that um, 
at about 100 patients or more, you start to get an improvement in all-cause uh, survival to hospital uh, discharge, or we say it another way, a reduction in in-hospital mortality, then again plateaus at about 300. This needs to be validated, obviously, but it does suggest that mechanical ventilation volumes on an institution levels may be a potential benchmark for CIC quality. So in this cartoon, what I'm trying to show you is that it doesn't really matter if you call yourself tertiary or you're academic. Um, in some sense, the volumes you put through and the number of patients you see with a number of conditions um, are tied to patient or are tied to better patient outcomes. And these volumes can also be um, um, can also be addressed in by improving the systems of care that save lives. And I'm sure many of you are aware that. Um, Systems of care have been successfully implemented for many time sensitive high acuity conditions such as STEMI, stroke, trauma, dissection, out of hospital cardiac arrest. And dare I say that cardiovascular care is not the leader. Um, you know, the, the grandfather of systems of care was probably trauma. And this data here shows uh, from 14 states, uh, including 18 level one trauma centers and 51 non trauma centers. It shows that if you were admitted to a hospital, uh, for trauma at a level one center, your relative risk of mortality was 20% lower if you went to a trauma, a level one trauma center than, than somewhere else, thus suggesting centralizing the care of these high acuity conditions improves outcomes. Well, what about cardiovascular care? Um, and this is from the STEMI Accelerator Program. Um, and this is 12 metropolitan US regions, 12 PCI head hospitals, and just under a thousand EMS centers. And two things were going on here. One was the quality feedback uh, cycle, but there was also a systems of care for revascularization in these metropolitan centers. And when you participated in the STEMI accelerated program, your first medical contact to device time, less than 90 minutes, significantly improved. And if you were a part of the accelerator program here, the, um, there was a reduction in mortality uh, that was not seen if you were not participating in these systems of care and regional care models. Dare I say that it's really not STEMI, it's not even cardiogenic shock that is the highest risk condition that we see on a regular basis. It's probably cardiac arrest or out of hospital cardiac arrest. And this is just isn't my opinion. This is from the Institute of Medicine that um, OCA survival hospital discharge in all comers is estimated to be less than 6%. But this does include the people that are pronounced in the field or pronounced in the ED. Um, we see a very select number of patients that survive the hospital discharge and they undergo targeted temperature management and, and other ICU level therapies. Well, do systems of care save lives? And I think the answer is yes. And this is um, uh, an analysis out of Arizona by Dan Spate and Ben Bobrow. And what they did is they took the entire state of Arizona and they designated 51 cardiac arrest receiving centers. And these centers could centralize care from everything from resuscitation to PCI through to ICD implantation and facilitate neurorehabilitation. And the plan was to um, transport these patients directly to these centers. And in the after uh, implementation phase, you can see here that amongst all rhythm witnessed arrest and shockable rhythms, um, that survival to hospital discharge and positive neurologic outcome survival improved after implementation of these regional care models. What's buried in the, the text here uh, that doesn't often get talked about is that there were, I believe they implemented hospital bypass of community centers directly to level one centers, um, thus dispelling the myth that there is something potentially life-saving about pulling an ambulance over to a community ICU to have a community um, ER doc continue a code. Um, the idea here is, it, like trauma, is to get them to a level one center as quickly as possible, and at least in all comers, that saves lives. Okay, so I've said that we need to get higher acuity conditions like shock and STEMI and cardiac arrest and mechanical ventilation to tertiary quaternary centers but this, this is gonna result in a significant higher level of acuity. And what are the strategies to embrace this new acuity and technology safely? And there's a few possible suggestions out there in the literature. And the first is staffing with CICU intensivists. And this is a study out of Korea published in, in JAK. And what they were able to do is transition from uh, an open model with multiple non-CICU intensivist trained intendings 
to a closed model where everyone was dual trained in cardiology and critical care. And what you can see here is that CIC mortality dropped from nearly 8% to 4%. What is more surprising to me is that um, this wasn't just a, a decrease in non-cardiovascular death and sepsis, which you might expect with some people with ICU level training, is that there was a significant decline in cardiovascular uh, death as well. But you're gonna say, well, there's no large pool of critical care cardiologists to, to fundamentally stay, change our staffing overnight. What are other care models? And this is from the University of Maryland where they had no intensive care um, cardiologists to my knowledge. And what they implemented is mandatory consultation in patients um, undergoing invasive mechanical ventilation. And what you can see here in that the post-intensive care um, consult period is there was a significant reduction in CIC length of stay and an increase in ventilator um, free days. And when they looked at adjusted mortality, there was also a significant reduction in odds of, um, uh, of survive or reduction in the odds of mortality when adjusted for Apache 2. So, this suggests that there may be a role for team-based care. If you're on the unit as an attending one week, it's not just you, but it, it, care and outcomes may be improved when you work with a group of people, including intensivists, uh, internal medicine subspecialty surgeons, and allied health professionals. And this concept of team-based care has certainly played out in the cardiogenic shock literature. And this is the, um, the cardiogenic shock algorithm from ANOVA, where... Um, they had activation of a shock team if you had low blood pressure with endorphin hypoperfusion. And through single point of care access call, it activated IC, cardiac surgery, advanced heart failure, and cardiac critical care. And in the post-implementation period, you can see that there's a near doubling in survival for acute MI shock and a 12% increase in survival for acute decompensated heart failure related shock. Now, you might ask me, you know, this is observational. Is it biased? Potentially. Could it be confounded? Probably. But do I believe it? Absolutely. And why do I say that is that I believe it because through all of medicine, the earlier intervention in high acuity time sensitive conditions improves outcomes. I can also say that with a little bit of confidence and that uh, the University of Ottawa and the Uni uh, University of Utah have shown similar analyses with the implementation of their shock teams that showed improved survival. Now you may say these are single center and maybe there's some temporal, tem temporal trend biases. Is there any multi-center data? And there is this year. Um, and this is from the CP3TN. And this is a cross-sectional analysis of 24 CICUs in US and Canada, only 10 of which had a shock team. And in the centers that had a shock team, what you can see here is that there is a higher use of pulmonary arterial catheter an overall lower use of mechanical circulatory support, which was, which somewhat paradoxically is offset by a higher use of more advanced mechanical circulatory support. But in the shock team centers, there was a 3% absolute reduction in uh, CIC mortality, thus suggesting building the picture that team-based care is associated with better outcomes. So I'm putting this slide up not to make fun of patients, but rather to make fun of us as physicians. And sometimes it's easier to change physician practice by adding a new medication or uh, to the armamentarium or change surgical practice, but it's harder to change the way we deliver care. And the data thus far shows that perhaps there's some potential improvements we can make to CICU staffing and practice. Number one, by closing the units with unit-based attendings. Number two, centralizing the care of high acuity conditions to hub centers that can comprehensively centralize their care from resuscitation through either palliation or recovery, the dual training of CICU attendings in critical care, and the adoption of team-based care for non-critical care attendings or even um, conditions such as cardiogenic shock. All right, so what are the pathways for trainees to get advanced training in critical care? And um, I'm putting this first slide up, which is from our Canadian CICU paper, um, uh, because as I've given similar lectures in, uh, in person, I've been accosted afterwards uh, by, by, by a few very spirited uh, attendings thinking I'm trying to push um, uh, competent people out of the CICU, and that's not the case. I'm putting this up because I wrote this paragraph, and 
I, th I think that current CICU physicians that are experienced, committed, and maintain an adequate volume of practice and competency shouldn't be pushed out. We need these people to deliver care, um, although care may change and training may change in the future. Um, we need um, people who have practiced in CICU because we can't replace them with people like myself. And at least data from um, a survey five years ago showed that only 15% of centers actually have a critical care cardiology training program. And a similar percentage of centers had at least one CICU intensivist. Um, and that's one, that's not multiple. So we really can't uh, um, replace all these people. And um, we're not much better in Canada. This data is a little bit older from a survey at the end of 2014, but then we've only had two people uh, or two centers with a cardiac intensivist. And there's my response. I am fortunate to say that we're graduating many people a year in these programs, but we're nowhere near ready to, um, uh, to change over staffing practices in our major centers. So what are the pathways to training? And in 2012, Dave Morrow with the scientific statement had proposed an additional completion of 12 months of clinical fellowship in critical care medicine to get, to get um, expertise in things like um, airway management, ventilation, uh, CRRT, and that they proposed two potential pathways. One is you finish your ICU, or sorry, you finish your critical care and do a year in ICU, but also the development of integrated programs, like four-year programs at least, where you do uh, critical care training concurrently with your ICU. Um, and there has been some advancement, albeit not perfect within, um, uh, within the US. I don't pretend to be the US expert, but what I can say is that the AIBM mandates, mandates at least 12 months of critical care exposure um, before you can write an, an exam. And COCATS 4 has come through with some training uh, guidance. Um, they don't have a nice figure, but in essence, they have level one, two, and three uh, training standards, and level three would um, require an additional 12 months or one year in uh, critical care medicine to work in primarily high volume um, academic centers. There are some challenges, though, with these recommendations is that there are still a small number of training programs in the U.S. and throughout Canada. Um, the training is sometimes done through dedicated critical care medicine programs, although there are some standalone um, CICU programs, and there's some an inconsistent patchwork of examination and certification criteria. Uh, to my knowledge in the U.S., there aren't any concurrent programs where you can enroll in cardiology right at the beginning and graduate with dual certification. In Canada, we're a little bit different. Um, you may not realize uh, that critical care medicine is actually a two-year standalone fellowship, which I did, although two of our centers, including the University of Alberta, have one-year programs designed to, to allow people to practice only in CICU. Um, this would exclude them, unlike the two-year program, from practicing in uh, medical, surgical, and neuro, uh, neuro ICUs. Um, the European Union, through the through the ESC, is miles ahead of both our uh, of both our countries. They've now had two documents on um, on what they call I, ICCU, intensive cardiac care units that have proposed staffing um, and structure. And they've been pretty clear through the acute cardiovascular care um, uh, committee and that they have clearly defined ICCU levels one to three. They have multiple established one-year training programs with formal examination and credit accreditation criteria that is recognized throughout the EU. And they also have a dedicated Congress and journal, which we're also trying to improve on uh, in North America as well through the ACC and the AHA. So uh, my last objective is to try and summarize uh, the evidence to support moving away from historical admission practices, such as everyone with an MI or a positive troponin or CKMB got admitted to a, a CICU. I think that has changed. And this is from the US Premier Registry of 306 hospitals, and it was published by Harlan Krumholtz's group. And what you can see here is that um, in these 306 hospitals, the median um, uh, CICU admission rate for people with an MI was about 48%, but there was almost an unfathomably large inter-hospital variation rate from zero to 98%. What they found is that in the highest admission quartile, so that is hospitals admitted the most patients, the highest admitters had the lowest uh, proportion of patients 
with critical care restricted therapies that included PA catheter use, vasoactives, and mechanical ventilation. And when they looked at uh, this, um, when they looked at by a risk standardized mortality rate here on the Y versus ICU admission rate on the X axis, this scatter plot shows that the, you can imagine uh, an almost perfectly flat line through the, the scatter plot, suggesting that there's no association between ICU admission rate and overall outcomes in these hospitals. They did a similar analysis, the same group from the US Premier Registry with heart failure, and this was published in circulation. Although the median admission rate for heart failure was, only, was between 10 and 12%, there was a similarly large inter-hospital ICU admission rate that ranged between 0% and 88%. Again, they found the same relationship. High ICU utilization centers had the lowest use of critical care restricted therapies such as vasoactives and mechanical ventilation. And again, when they looked at risk standardized mortality rates, um, the high and the low admission groups, there was absolutely no difference. Now, I don't want you to feel like I'm picking on cardiology. This is a problem that extends to ICUs as well. Um, this is a four state analysis of medical ICUs, and they took four common medical ICU admission conditions, DKA, PE, upper GI bleed, and congestive heart failure. And again, a similar a scatter plot that looked at, at adjusted mortality versus probability of ICU admission. And again, through all these conditions, you, you can see almost a perfectly flat correlation curve, thus suggesting that ICU admission rates don't correlate with um, survival. Now, is this is an American model? Is it, just, is it just you guys? Surely this can't be happening in Canada where we have single payer healthcare systems and we're not for profit. Well, that's really not the case. We're not much better than, um, than you guys. And this is data from uh, my own analyses. And what you can see is our Canadian provinces across the bottom here. And in blue, we have STEMI, yellow and STEMI, unstable angina in gray, and heart failure in, in red. And to sum up this variation, which you can see visually, um, the interprovincial differences in STEMI admission rates vary by, um, um, by 35%. And STEMI, it's even worse. The variation is almost 60%. Unstable angina, 30%, and heart failure by 50%. Um, and when we look at provinces by the percentage, this is a heat map of the percentage of patients who do not get any critical care therapies uh, within two days of admission. What you can see here is we're not doing very well. We have some provinces where 80% of patients don't get any critical care therapy. And even at best in British Columbia, um, 46% of patients don't get critical care therapies, thus suggesting that um, patient acuity and hospital care resources aren't aligned and there's an opportunity for improvement. We did a similar scatter plot here um, on a provincial basis, um, looking at ICU admission rate versus adjusted mortality. And you know what? Don't get fooled by, whoops, by a p-value of 001. And R squared of nine really suggests that the uh, the in only 9% of the interprovincial um, differences in mortality can be explained by admission rates. Stated in under, another way, 91% of the interprovincial differences in mortality are explained by something else, uh, meaning that this is a very small contributor um, uh, to differences in outcome. In Canada, we also looked at hospital size and the volume and the size of our hospital really matters when we look at these uh, interprovincial differences. Um, what you can see here on the left is that our teaching hospitals had the highest proportion of patients in the CIC with critical care restricted therapies. Um, and, if you, and if you look at patients here, obviously this is the same uh, data presented a different way. And um, a minority of those had none within the first two days. So that meaning that some did to compensate over time. Our small community hospitals were the biggest offenders where only 9% of the patients had any critical care restricted therapies. Uh, thus suggesting that there's a, a, um, a potential to better align practices. What about specific conditions? And do NSTEMIs really benefit from routine CICU admission? Well, guidelines say that stable and STEMI patients can go to a telemetry ward based on level C evidence. Um, and one of my own analyses looked at this. This is the, um, an editorial by Dave Morrow's uh, trainee. Um, and what I'd like you to pay attention to are three things. 
Um, the year of many of these data were all pre-2003 until recently, my own analysis was 2008. And many of these studies were um, just several hundred people with mortality rates of uh, exceeding 10%. The analysis I'm going to show you, uh, we dwarf all of these um, by, by analyzing 8,000 patients and had a more contemporary CIC mortality and ward rate of 1.2 and 1.3% respectively. The way we were able to do this was through data linkages. Um, we have population health data sets that we're able to link, link. And I think we're able to quite clearly compare patients who are stable at the time of admission and we looked at those admitted to um, a CCU versus a cardiology ward with, with, uh, with telemetry capabilities. And as I've uh, sort of um, foreshadowed here, there was no difference in in-hospital death shown above here. And that was the same between low, intermediate, and high-risk patients. We also looked at these patients between NSTEMI and unstable angina. No difference. We looked at those that were cared for by a primary cardiologist no difference. We even sub-selected the people that underwent an in-hospital angiogram and then further risk stratified them by Duke Jeopardy score, uh, angiography score. Again, no difference, suggesting that there's nothing life-saving about a, a CIC admission for an NSTEMI patient. Um, really what they need is a, a telemetry monitor if they don't require the provision of critically, uh, critical care restricted therapies. Well, there's some cost to this too. Um, ICUs are expensive care units. And in my own work, what we've tried to do, at least in Canada, was evaluate the potential cost savings. And in looking at all Canadian CICU admissions for non-ST elevation myocardial infarction, we looked at those in high, medium, and uh, low utilization centers. And not surprisingly, that the low utilization centers had the lowest proportion of in-hospital costs incurred by, CIC, um, by CICU care. What we found is that there was no difference in mortality by utilization. And we also posed the question, well, what if all hospitals adopted low utilization patterns? And we were really conservative in what this meant. Um, uh, and we estimated that the savings would be $113 million. Um, if we were less conservative, that was about three and a half times higher. Using back of the napkin um, calculations, you know, your population in the US, you're about 10 times bigger and your hospital care is, I don't know, about 30% more expensive. So suddenly in the US using these uh, metrics, if, if it were to hold true, the cost savings in the US would be 10 figures. Well, heart failure is might even be a bigger problem. In Canada, we had... Um, uh, intra-hospital admission rates to CICUs ranging from 0% to just over 50%. And a similar graph shown a different way is that in our high utilization hospitals for CICUs and heart failure, they had the highest proportion of hospital costs incurred by CICU, but also in blue here, the lowest proportion, uh, had the lowest proportion of critical care therapies, same to the Crumholtz papers. And when we looked at the potential cost savings, it was $234 million. And you can do the back of the nap napkin calculations on what that might mean in the US. Well, what about STEMI? Like, do all STEMI still require um, an admission to CICU? And I'm going to argue no. People have maybe forgotten the Zoli score, um, which is applied post primary PCI and includes six, um, six metrics. And in the validation cohort for the Zoli score, if you have a Zoli score of four or less, you have a less than 1.5% chance of 30-day mortality, thus suggesting that you have a really low risk and maybe you could go to a telemetry-enabled ward. And my friends and colleagues in Winnipeg actually tested this prospectively. And in 450 patients, they used the Zoli score to stratify them into low and high-risk patients. And not surprisingly, um, amongst the low risk, there were, there were some appropriate clinically driven crossover uh, for things like uh, ASA desensitization or bradycardia that aren't captured by the, the score. But what you can see here is that amongst the low risk patients that went to a ward, the, the in-hospital mortality rate was 0.5%. And when you compare the low risk patients that went to either telemetry ward or CICU, somewhat reassuringly, there was no difference in things like cardiogenic shock, 
pulmonary edema, renal replacement, or in-hospital death. Um, and the Zoli score performed pretty well. I mean, the, the C index here was 0 0.91, which, was, which is excellent as far as uh, models go, thus suggesting that your low-risk STEMI patients post-primary PCI can safely be discharged to the ward. And this is something we try and do at our own institution because we just don't have the critical care capacity to deal with all the, the STEMIs. So with this cartoon, the argument I'm trying to make here is that I think we have a misalignment between expensive high acuity and uh, high acuity CICU resources and patient care needs. And there's a substantial population of the patients we care for in the US, Canada and abroad that can potentially be cared for in a lower acuity environment. And I'm putting this cartoon up, not to make fun of patients, but to you know tease us as ICU attendings, well, maybe it shouldn't just be up to the ICU attending in all cases, whether they need urgent level of care or lower acuity care. And this is something that we've tried to um, propose in a thought piece in circulation, um, and that maybe CICU admissions may warrant uh, appropriate use criteria in the future. And I won't go through all these, uh, these, these columns, but the principle is threefold. Number one, are the patient's goals of care and the potential benefits in keeping with CICU? Um, number two, do they need critical care restricted therapies like mechanical ventilation or vasoactives? If they do, they should be admitted if their goals of care allow it. And finally, if you don't require critical care restricted therapies, what is the meaningful risk of clinical deterioration? And I think when you look across many common admission criteria, we can find stratum of these patients that could be uh, better cared for in a lower cost telemetry environment, like a ward or even a step down unit, depending on uh, the infrastructure of your hospital. So to summarize the CICU utilization, I think the clinical acuity and complexity of CICU patients has uh, increased, but there's significant interhospital variation. Dual training and cardiology intensive care is growing, but we, can, we need um, experienced and competent cardiologists to continue to provide the care. Uh, but team-based care is growing and is evolving into a practice standard into things like cardiogenic shock. Our CICU admission rates and the provision of CICU restricted therapies is variable. And observational studies that many end STEMIs and low-risk STEMIs can be cared for in a ward. So this is my last slide um, put together by um, uh, a piece in Jack by my friend Jason Katz, kind of uh, outlining the uh, evolution and maturation of critical care uh, in cardiology. And I think we've shown in foundations that we have evolving uh, acuity and comorbidity in our units. Care delivery, I think we've shown that uh, we can improve uh, patient outcomes uh, with improvements to staffing structure and regional systems of care and the adoption of standard protocols. We're growing in educational and training. We're not there yet. There's still a relatively small number of people like myself that are dual trained, but this is growing. And the final frontier is CICU-based um, research, um, showing, that, showing that there are practice standards uh, with, and uh, treatment standards that can improve care in things like cardiogenic shock or um, uh, very advanced acute decompens of heart failure and so on and so forth. So with that, I will uh, end my presentation and uh, I'm happy to take uh, questions. And uh, I appreciate the comment at the beginning about the Battle of Alberta. Uh, the first game didn't go, didn't go very well for us in Edmonton and we're looking for a better result tonight. So uh, thank you for your attention.